So welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Catherine Meenan and I chair the Germany Group here in the Institute of International and European Affairs. We're very fortunate today to have uh, Derek Scally with us, the, uh, the Irish Times Berlin correspondent. Uh, most people, most chairs start by saying he needs no introduction, but I think in case that's certainly true. But I'd just like to make one or two housekeeping points before we start. Both the presentation and the question and answer session will be on the record. And this will also, this um, event will also be on the Institute's uh, YouTube channel. So if I can introduce, in spite of everything, Derek, he's a native Dubliner, as you might have guessed, studied at DCU and the Humboldt University in Berlin. He's been the Irish Times correspondent since 2001. He covers politics, business and culture is a regular contributor to uh, German news outlets. And those of you who may have missed his, his famous article on how Aldi in Ireland is so much better than Aldi in Germany, uh, will know that he is a, a national figure in that regard. So uh, it's just a year now uh, since the new German government took over. Uh, it's been a very challenging year for governments all over Europe, but I think the German government has had particular challenges uh, across a whole range of uh, areas. So we're looking forward very much uh, to Derek's uh, talk on this. He'll talk for 20 to 25 minutes and then he'll answer questions. So if you want to ask questions, if you wouldn't mind using the Q&A function and if you wouldn't mind identifying yourself when you're doing that. So Derek, we look forward to what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you to the IEA and to all of you for joining in. I've seen some old friends, some new friends, and um, yeah, it's nice to have you with us. Um, we've got an awful lot to get get through, um, so I'll just jump in. But uh, we had an interesting break from from the monotony of war and inflation today. A, a, a large aquarium, sixteen meters high, has just exploded in one of the hotels just opposite the Berlin Main Cathedral. So, uh, sixteen hundred fish washed out onto the street. Firefighters. It's just Berlin can't do airports, and it now clearly can't do aquaria. So um, just a little bit of light relief there. Obviously, the, the relatives of the fish have been informed of this tragedy. Um, so, uh, yeah, that was quite a, ending the year with a bang. And what a year it has been. Uh, a year ago, we had this three-way traffic light coalition in office. And, yeah, they, they, had, they came in promising quite a bit. They promised to marry social democracy social justice with with a green agenda and then somehow bring in sort of a liberal spin on things as well and they they um yeah this is the post merkel attempt to relaunch germany and they call themselves an alliance for freedom justice and sustainability and they had a very ambitious 160 page program for government um this was going to include new industrialization they pl promised that they would have a new industrial revolution in germany you know tapping into the old siemens tradition by they said look the world needs to go post carbon and we can provide them the technology and the machines to do it. we will build the machines that will uh, create the the post carbon world economies um great plans god laughs when men make plans and um, nobody's laughing obviously since the 24th of february and um just this weekend the weekend coming up we can see the effect of the war on ukraine uh, in Germany, we've got from one direction, from the west, we've got a ship approaching Wilhelmshaven up on the North Sea coast carrying LNG from Norway, uh, liquid nat liquefied natural gas. And from the other direction, from Poland this weekend, we have a deal where Poland will supply the largest refinery in northeast Germany. Every car and every plane in northeast Germany is fueled by this refinery. And it was uh, it was being supplied with air, uh, with um uh, crude oil from Russia, not anymore. It's coming from Poland. So you can see in just one weekend, fuel coming from both sides. And um, this is, uh, you know, Germany was supposed to be decarbonizing its economy. It now seems to be de-Russifying its economy and its energy sector and also its politics. Um, and it's a staggering, it's a staggering pace. Uh, my former boss, Paul Gillespie, once remarked to me in Germany, he said, yeah, Germany is always like a slow burn. And I've often thought of it like that way. It's like a very expensive candle. You don't get fireworks. The flame just goes and the candle is a very steady flame. But 
What we've seen in the last 12 months, I mean, we've seen it in Ireland, we've seen it everywhere, but by German standards, this is extraordinary pace. And um, of course, forced by circumstances, forced by perhaps missteps in the past, um, but the corrections and the speed of the corrections by anyone's standards are fast, but by German standards are, are warp speed. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the parties. I'd like to talk about some of the policies that have changed and then some personal reflections on the German-Irish relationship. Um, politically, um, it's, 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 it's staggering, really. Um, I mean, we have the SPD, a Social Democrats. So they were, you know, the mainstream center left party. They were always emotionally attached to friendship with Russia. We had the Willy Brandt area of detente. We had Schroeder, Gerhard Schroeder, Chancellor Schroeder, his policy of transformation through trade. And, um, and that's all gone. It is all collapsed. It is staggering. Um, as one of the SPD leaders said recently, um, Europe wants to organize its security now, not with Europe, or not, sorry, uh, Germany and Europe wants to organize its security, not with Russia, but against Russia. Coming from the mouth of an SPD leader, that is a staggering change of pace in a, in a staggering era, of course. The Greens, the second party in the government, um, you know, pacifist um, climate policy, and they've just embraced without much fuss, a hundred billion special fund and um, the largest military spending program in modern, modern German history. They've also agreed to extend the life of nuclear power plants until next spring, rather than closing in December. Um, they've agreed to fire up coal uh, coal burning energy plants um, and the LNG ships are already coming a huge burden to environment all of these things and if they've gone along with it um, you know they wanted Germany to be a pioneer in climate protection they're just going to have to wait and yet they've agreed to wait so the pragmatism from the green camp uh, is also remarkable and the final part of the coalition is the free democrats the liberal free democrats um, yeah, I'll get back to them later in the government in the, the presentation. They're kind of the problem there. But very briefly, they came in promising to end the pandemic emergency spending. Next year, they said we will reintroduce the constitutional debt break, limiting how much um, borrowing, uh, how much borrowed money German politicians can give a uh, spend in a year. Instead, the finance minister, the FDP leader, Christian Lin, he signed off on the 100 billion special fund. There's been a 200 billion stimulus package. Um, all of our heating bills in Germany are being paid by Christian Lindner this month. Uh, and there's been other stimulus packages. And this this week, his ministry has basically uh, been behind the largest ever debt issue um, for next year, 539 billion euro. This is a small state, free liberal, free Democrat liberal finance minister folk. So he still insists that the debt break will be back next year. Um, but he's got very creative accountants borrowing lots of money and parking it outside the main balance sheet. Um, so as you see, SPD, Greens and FTP, they're in places they could not have imagined a year ago. We all are, but in Germany, it's quite something. Just this week in the Bundestag, Gerhard, um, excuse me, Olaf Scholz, the new chancellor, he he said he 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 built on his Zeitenwende rhetoric. Since February, he's created a narrative, which I think is quite clever. He talked about the Zeitenwende, which best translates as a watershed, I think. And he said that obviously the war has changed everything, um, also in Germany, but it's been in his eyes a huge miscalculation for Putin, his imperial ambitions. Uh, his mania for power, it's all backfired. And he said the real story of 2022 uh, is not the invasion, but how everyone has stood by Ukraine, the courage of the Ukrainians, the solidarity of Europe, and, um, and that Moscow hasn't achieved a single goal of its okay. war. Um, I just throw in three observations here. And uh, number one, um, the remarkable feat just on the energy front. There's so many fronts, but I'll just focus on energy. Um, you know, this time last year, 14% of German energy was coming from gas. Of that 14%, more than half, around 55% was Russian. And that's all gone. Um, some pipelines have been throttled, other pipelines have been blown up. Uh, and yet it has managed to completely reposition its energy hungry economy and keep the lights on. Um, and it's filled up its gas uh, reserves to 100%, and it has taken control of two uh, uh, wholesale gas importers. Um, by anyone's standards, that's remarkable. And Schultz has really said that the, the crisis, you know, 
of despite the massive human tragedy, despite the huge uh, insecurities, it has expedited Germany to do in months things that would normally take years. And we will hope the war is over soon, but we will hope that this will also stand in good stead for, for Germany as a major manufacturing power in Europe. Um, Scholz said that um, Russia got things wrong. I think it's, it's worth pointing out that Ger many senior Germans got things wrong on this front twice. Um, first, they got it wrong on Russia, insisting you know, what was good for German business, and Russia was very good for German business, very profitable for German business, that this was somehow good for Germany and good for Europe. And the idea was the more you're trading with people, they have no interest in, in um, collapsing those business contacts. What well, we've learned when you have somebody irrational uh, heading the state, anything is possible. So they, there was sort of a sense, I think, now in hindsight that they were lying to themselves, that this is somehow good. And it, it was good for Germany. And uh, I think many senior Germans have realized that they had created a narrative that just suited themselves. Um, and um, so this has been a year of rude awakenings for many of them. And I would also say that I think many senior Germans got it wrong in Ukraine. There's many senior officials who were briefing uh, the Ukrainian ambassador here and other people saying, oh, well, Ukraine will give them a week and we'll we'll just we'll just we'll we'll pick up the pieces then. And um, yeah, the Russia, Ukraine has almost lasted a year. And uh, I think many senior officials, including in Schultz administration, are are eating their words. So um, that's the crisis um, on the energy front in particular, but day-to-day -day business is continuing in Germany. Um, I think from my perspective, I think the most in, one of the most interesting and perhaps even underreported stories because we're all on, on a war footing is, is just how the, the SPD, uh, Scholz's SPD has stepped up. Um, you know, they spent for the last 16 years, there were three times the bridesmaid in, in the grand coalition with Angela Merkel. They were struggling to find themselves. They never quite recovered from the shrewder economic and social reforms that many viewed as treachery. And, and here we have Olaf Scholz, a former labor minister, um, governing mayor of Hamburg. And of course, in the last term, he was federal finance minister at Angela Merkel. He stepped up and with he didn't even have 100 days to find his feet. Um, and yet here he has, he's running quite a tight ship. He has good advisors. Um, and um, from, a, from a journalist perspective, it's, it's quite a, an efficiently run operation. We can argue about the politics, but in terms of day to day, it's, a, it's, it's quite an open, far o more open than the Merkel era. I mean, the, Merkel ran, she had many qualities, but from my perspective, she ran almost a regime of fear among officials that anyone was, everyone was afraid of saying something because she demanded trust like to a, an extraordinary degree. So it was actually very hard to find out anything about what they were thinking, just to even flag things, even ahead of a, a European Council meeting. Um, so the government has been, um, the SPD-led government has really stepped up. It has been quite professional, well-oiled machine. Um, Schultz himself has had a few interesting revealing moments um, at the G7. I was at the G7 earlier this year uh, down in Bavaria, and there was a very interesting snippy answer given to a journalist who I know, and he just gave a one word answer uh, or said, I've already answered that. And he's, he's had this a, a few times. And I think it's an interesting character reflection with Merkel. You often knew she was the smartest woman in the room and she probably had she knew her portfolio and everyone else's portfolios at the table, but she never let it show. She would never um, she would never humiliate a journalist or another leader. Schultz has done that several times this year. And people I know who know him closely, they say he does often feel he is the smartest person in the room. Maybe he is, or maybe that's a character trait that will trip him up in the future. We'll see. Um, I think a key reason why things have worked so well for Schultz, if you can speak of that in this year of crisis, is his party is so quiet. The SPD is usually... Um, you know, the cliche of center left parties, you know, the first item on the agenda is the split. And yet his SPD, he is not the leader, as many of you know, he is um, chancellor, he has two people running the ship, and, um, and they have managed to keep his, his back clear, there are, it's a very disciplined operation. And um, I think partly it's because they've delivered quite quickly. They had a key election plan, which was to reform the welfare, the welfare reforms of the Schroeder era, which effectively crippled the party for years. Um, um, for various reasons, they were seen as, you know, too neoliberal. They were seen as humiliating, forcing people to sort of present their bank accounts and their assets 
and and just being they just felt it was uh, there was sort of arbitrary humiliation by the welfare system they've gotten rid of a lot of that so the party is extremely happy they feel this great mistake of 20 years ago has been corrected um i think the greens as the government i think also despite everything they've had a good year uh, again the the two green ministers in in government that's annalena baerbock in foreign and robert habeck in economics and energy um, they are able to focus on their portfolio. They are also not party leaders. The Greens have a rule, if you become a minister, you have to hand over the leadership. So they handed over the leadership and the, the parliamentary party leadership are doing an excellent job. They have for, forced their members to swallow one uh, bitter pill after another, particularly on energy and environment. And um, that has allowed both Baerbock and um, Robert Habeck just to, to focus the clear messaging, fast action, a real sense of calm and capability in this. I mean, Annalena Baerbock, she was in Ireland last week with Simon Coveney, um, maintaining a consistent message on, on Ireland, UK, Brexit. Uh, we can talk about this later if there are questions, but um, strong on, on Iran and other issues. And many people underestimated her. She was seen as a lightweight um, a young mother, all the usual questions that a young father would never be asked. And yet she's she stepped up and she's been quite impressive. Robert Habeck has, had a, has, a, has quite a good year in a crisis. You know, his job is effectively to keep the lights on and convince his party that this is the time for pragmatism rather than principle on energy and the climate. Um, he had to go cap in hand to Qatar for LNG. There's an image of him appearing to bow to his hosts. I think that will haunt him forever. But he's kept the lights on his German industry has managed to reduce its gas usage by 25 percent production hasn't dropped that much so he says the country is well placed to get through the winter so the SPD is calm Schultz is in the saddle quickly the Greens are being pragmatic and not attacking their ministers um, and but as I mentioned before I think the FDP is the party to watch if there's going to be a problem if something's going to erupt in next year I think it is the FDP um, we've got more emergency spending more money have to be found for things we don't know where things are going on energy prices and many people many FDP voters are saying what is the FDP for what are they doing in government for us where is their profile and traditionally, the FDP is the party of you know, business owners, of doctors, of lawyers. Um, it has pushed through some tax cuts, including for top earners, so it's traditional um, voters. Um, but it's effectively being as statist as it could be. It's literally the opposite end of the political spectrum to where it traditionally should be. Um, Lindner, as finance minister, he's admitted this. He said, yes, there are certain dilemmas uh, in his role. He's doing one thing as finance minister. Um, and trying to do another thing as party leader. Um, but he said, look, um, I could be ideological. I could say none of this was in our manifesto. We don't have to do any of this. Um, but that would be nonsense. That would be a disaster. So he's putting the portfolio and the country ahead of the party. He's, he's still got three years to the next election. So people might say he's got time. But, you know, they've had a disastrous year. They've lost power in two coalition governments in, in the federal states. And um, they were kicked out of parliament in a third federal state. So that's a very bad showing. Um, Lindner is unchallenged in the party for now, but there's a window and that window will close soon, probably within the next 12 months. And then they have to start, um, they have to start showing their teeth or showing their voters that the FTP fingerprints can be seen in government. Um, so how is the government doing a year in? Um, there are around 44% in polls when you take the three parties together. So that's down from a year ago when they were elected, it was 52. Um, I don't think that's too drastic considering everything usually can go, that can go wrong does go wrong in the first year. Uh, and many people are still doubtful that the SPD Green FDP traffic light is really a fit. Um, some others have said, well, actually, for Scholz, it's quite nice to have these two parties because uh, they keep each other in check. And if they're going to be rows, I think, between the Greens and the FDP, that's where the, the greatest antipathy often lies. The Social Democrats obviously have had coalitions with both parties in the past. For Scholz personally, I think it suits him to have an FDP man in 
finance ministry and assuming things calm down within this term of office, um, Schultz is much more of a conservative, less likely to want to throw taxpayers' money at every problem that passes. So having somebody like Christian Lindner, I think suits him. They've been considered quite close in this last year, whereas Lindner and Robert Habeck um, seem to be two alpha males determined to have it out at every opportunity. Once this year, Schultz had to uh, intervene and use his, um, his uh, I, I'm not even sure how to translate the word, because a Richtlinien competence, which means uh, he basically blows the whistle on a fight and says, I'm the chancellor, we're doing this, end of discussion. And there have been mixed views on whether that was a show of strength or a show of weakness. Some people would say it's a show of weakness because if you have to sort of wave your, your red card or your red yellow card so early on in a term, does that really, uh, what do you do the next time? Other people have said it was a strategic move, but you see, it's not all plain sailing for this government, but, um, and some people are afraid there've been so many rows that they're sort of burning up energy, political energy as a coalition far faster than they would at normal times. Um, so we will see uh, where that leads. Um, I'm looking at the clock. I've got about five more minutes. There's so much I could talk about, but I'll, I'll just take you through some of the other things that have caught my attention during the year. Um, uh, there's been lots of talk of this Seifenbende, um, this change in uh, it's a, a watershed, I guess would be the best way to describe it. Um, but of course, this watershed, particularly on the defense front, is sapping up a lot of energy uh, resources and energy that isn't you available elsewhere. For instance, last August in Prague, um, Schultz gave a very interesting underreported speech. I think I reported on it, but most people didn't. The government, actually, people I spoke to were quite surprised. We thought that was quite a good speech, they said. And it was a very good speech. Um, on the communication front, I just throw in, I mean, Schultz is just a million times better than Merkel. He's not a, a, a natural orator, nor was Merkel. But he clearly has speechwriters working for him. And Merkel, as far as I know, used to just take in um, blocks of text from various government departments, and her office manager would just basically cut and paste them together into a speech. Whereas Scholz clearly has communication experts working with him. And, you know, as somebody in the communications business, it does make a difference. But interestingly enough, the Prague speech was also quite clever. Um, didn't get much attention. And he, but he, he made clear to say, look, I am making some proposals on the future of Europe. These are food for thought. He said they're not ready-made German solutions. What he was talking about was, um, obviously, we need to do more to move towards um, decision making by majority votes, um, particularly on foreign and fiscal policy, all Irish ears pop up then. Um, but he said preserving the status quo was worse than what what than the alternative because Europe would be a sort of as if it continues down this path to be a confusing tangle and proliferation of opt ins and opt outs multi speed Europe. He said, I don't think we need to, um, this obsession with having a national commissioner for every country needs to go. Um, and he also made an interesting remarks on, on um, this taboo no breaking notion of Brussels issuing debt. Um, this was from Merkel, this was the ultimate taboo. And then she gave in on the um, COVID emergency funding, uh, but said it was a once off, nobody believed her. Um, and the Constitutional Court in Germany last week said, well, you know, under limited circumstances, Brussels borrowing debt for emergency circumstances, we don't see a problem, which is, of course, going to raise huge issues uh, on what Germany is prepared and not prepared to bankroll on a European level. Um, Scholz appears to have made that dependent on movement on fiscal issues. So um, if you want Brussels issued debt with Germany's blessing, what about those Irish tax rates? Of course, we've got the international um, corporate tax rate agreement. But, um, you know, he's he's open to treaty change, which is new. But he said on a form follows function basis uh, where clear proposals offer clear gains. I think that's an interesting change. I think it's an interesting pragmatism. Um, Berlin has been more vocal on Poland, on Hungary. Um, you remember the China visit, huge upset over that. But everyone I spoke to have said, look, China is there. Germany is speaking with its European hat on. Obviously, it's got German business in the, in the back, but um, but he's been quite strong on pushing back against the US idea of this era of bipolarity in the international order. He said, we're not facing a new Cold War. We, it's, a, it's a multipolar world. We need to find shifting partnerships um, based on the rule of law and human rights without ideological blinkers. Uh, I think that chimes very well with, um, with Ireland. And that's... Um, 
the last two things I would raise. Um, number one, Ireland and Germany have been pushing a much closer relationship since 2018. Uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs has been crucial in this. I mean, in a time of an amazing upsets and confusion and so on, this has been consistently pushed. Uh, I think Simon Coveney, if he's finishing up as Minister for Foreign Affairs, we don't know. Uh, I think that has basically been one of his great political achievements. He's just remained consistently interested, engaged, curious about Germany. Um, there have been state visits in both directions. And... Um, and pr pushing this message of partnerships based on rules-based order, international law, the rule of law, um, on a political level, business level, also cultural level. There's, there's a lot, there has been a lot of movement, there has been a lot of investment, there's more to come on that front. So I think just from a German-Irish perspective, it's the, the change hasn't, I, nobody I've spoke to have said there's been any disimprovement on things. And I think Baerbock's visit to Ireland ahead of London was significant. Um, the, the London trip ended up being cancelled because the plane couldn't be de-iced in time. She spent four hours sitting on the tarmac in Dublin. Um, but um, I think Irish-German relations are in a very strong spot and all credit to Coveney and his team for pushing that consistently. Um, the final thing I would say, and I think it's quite interesting, is Merkel. She's like the elephant in the corner now. Um, she she left office on a high, and since then it's been downhill quite quickly. And there's nothing like losing sort of the nimbus of power, as they call it here, to suddenly make somebody appear a bit like the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain rather than the great and powerful Oz in front of the curtain. Um, she gave a ludicrous interview in June um, on the stage of the Berlin Ensemble Theatre here, the Brecht stage. And she said, oh, I always knew Putin wanted to destroy Europe. Um, and then she said, oh, yes, of course, I increased our energy dependency. And the journalist on the stage didn't ask her, if you knew he wanted to destroy you, why were you buying more and more gas from him? Last week, she finally made a concession. She, she made some, starting to make some self-critical remarks about her legacy, particularly on Russia. You know, she spoke about the circumstances. She wanted to move Germany to a renewables future and Russian gas was always going to just be a bridging energy source but she said yes we should have reacted more swiftly to Russia's aggression in the past we should have spent more money on defense um she didn't want to interrupt the plans for uh, Nord Stream 2 because she said they would have had to legislate against the pipeline and she felt at the time that would have been a very bad signal to Russia um and on on spending and um she said, well, you know, the pressure of war has sort of boosted spending on military spending that I always wanted but couldn't get through. And when she was asked, well, why didn't she do more? And she said, well, there would have been absolutely no political acceptance. And, well, and then the interviewer asked, well, why didn't you push for political acceptance? And then she, she sort of fell back on Helmut Kohl. And he said, Helmut Kohl, I always followed the Helmut Kohl idea that what depends on politics is what comes out at the end. And very much so politics is the art of the possible. Uh, and she said, giving a quote, giving a rousing speech on defense spending, she meant giving a rousing speech only to end up like a paper tiger wouldn't have helped the defense budget. Uh, and she said, but we didn't do enough for deterrence through higher defense spending. So for me, that's quite a telling, quite a sad remark. But Merkel, she mastered politics as the art of the possible. She sees now that she didn't do enough. She points out some reasons why she was prevented, but there was never a sense that she was pushing to do more. Um, she did quite a bit, uh, particularly with the Minsk agreement and so on. But the sense is that she always did what was possible. She always did what was tactically clever rather than strategically wise. So a year on, her legacy is sort of the varnish has started to crack. It will be interesting to see if her many achievements are then overshadowed by some strategic errors. Um, so listen, I'm looking at the clock. I could go on. I've been researching Ireland and Germany, the EEC 50 years ago. I could talk to you about the Reichsbürger. Um, I've got so many more things I could talk about, but I think at this stage, I've had enough of my own voice. So let's get some questions and, uh, and uh, we can continue the conversation. Mm -hmm.